Let's turn back to Isaiah chapter 53. You remember that that's where I was? I mean, uh, Isaiah 26. You remember that's where I was this morning? And I just want to continue. I never finish a message. I just quit. And so I'm going to kind of take up right here and just continue on. But this morning I was using Isaiah 26, 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because he trusteth in him. And I was sharing that the word mind right here in the Hebrew, it, the word literally means conception. And there are four times in the Old Testament where this same Hebrew word, I've got two different Hebrew dictionaries I use, and one of them it's Y-E-T-S-E-R, and the other one is Y-E-S-E-R. So I don't know which it is. These two dictionaries uh, spell it differently. But anyway, this same word is translated imagination four times. This morning, I said it was in uh, Genesis 11, 6. I looked it up. It's actually Genesis 6, 5 that it was translated imagination, where he says every imagination of their thought, uh, thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. But the word was translated imagination, and it means conception. And I was talking about that to dwell in the secret place of the Lord, you have to keep your mind stayed on him. The word stayed means to grab hold, to grasp. The word stayed, if you look up the English word, it means in a fixed position. It doesn't fluctuate. In other words, you don't visit there, you have to stay there. So this is what I was talking about, and I began to talk about the power of imagination this morning. Let's turn over to uh, Psalms chapter 1, and I want to show you some more things here about your imagination. And I'm not going to just stay on this all night, but it is important that you understand some of these things I didn't have time to say this morning. In Psalms chapter 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Did you know meditation fits perfectly with what I've been saying? And really, not just me, but every person here, all of the speakers who've ministered, it's been talking about the same thing, about just keeping your heart and your mind stayed upon God. And that's what meditation is all about. Meditation is when you take something and you just focus on it and stay on it. So many people, when they read the Bible, they're trying to cover a large amount of Material. They think that they've got to read 20 chapters or something and somehow that benefits you. And really, it depends on where you are. You know, you can't meditate on something that you don't know. So when you first get started in the Lord, there is a place to just read through the Bible. Because you've got to get all of this information put on the inside of you. You've got to get a context for these things instead of just taking little scriptures out of context. So there, it depends on where you are in your relationship with the Lord. If you are just really getting started, you need to have a systematic plan of just reading through the scriptures and covering large amount of territory and learning things. But meditation is where you really see a lot of power released in your life. And let me just say this. Meditation to some people is a bad word. They associate it with Eastern meditation, sitting in a lotus position and going om. But you know what? The uh, Muslims, they pray too. Are you going to quit praying because they pray? There is a right and a wrong way to meditate. And the Bible has a lot of things to say about meditation. And right here it says that the man who delights himself in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. See, this is consistent with what I was talking about, that we've got to dwell in the presence of the Lord. And one of the ways you do it is by meditation. And uh, I used this the other night. Let me read verse 3. It says, He shall be, the person who does these things, meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now look in chapter 2, verse 1. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And if you take Psalms chapter 2, it's talking about how this world system 
blasphemes and, re- and rebels at God, that God's going to laugh at them. He's going to get the last word. It talks about the sun right here, uh, reference to the Lord Jesus in this second chapter. But my point is that in chapter 2, verse 1, when it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The word imagine in two one is the exact same Hebrew word, yet sir, that was used in Psalms chapter one, verse two, and translated meditate. So this is some of how you gain revelation of the Word of God is not just to read it in the English, but go back and find the words that these things were translated from. And from by, by putting these together, here's a point that can be made that to meditate As in Psalms chapter 1, verse 2, you have to imagine, as in Psalms chapter 2, verse 1. Your imagination is a part of meditating. And again, so many people don't understand this. You know, when I was a kid, I didn't even understand these scriptures. I'd never uh, thought about this, but I don't know. It's just the way that the Lord led me. But I remember reading about Goliath and David. And I remember going out and marking nine foot six inches on a tree. Because that's what most of the uh, commentaries said that, you know, Goliath's height was. And David was probably five feet or less. And so I marked his height on a tree and then I bent down to look at it and get a comparison. And you know what I was doing? I was imagining. I was imagining what was it like when David saw this giant. I was trying to picture it. I was trying to see it. We went on a tour to Israel, and we were on a bus. There was about 40-something of us, and I was the uh, default tour guide. It's a long story, but I thought I was a person going on the tour. When I got there, I was the tour guide. And it was so anyway, we went to the Valley of Elah where David and Goliath fought and it was a hot day and the guy parked on the side of the road and he said, this is the Valley of Elah. Does anybody want to get out? Nobody wanted to get out but me. But I got out and I walked down to that stream, that little dry creek bed that ran through there. And I stood there and I picked up five smooth stones exactly like David did. And I just stood there and I looked On those mountains, and I imagined what it would be like to see hundreds of thousands of Philistines surrounding you. And then I remembered, uh, you know, thinking about Goliath. And you know what I was doing? I was using my imagination. This is meditating. This is how you meditate. When you read something in the Bible, if you read about Jesus raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, see it in your imagination. You imagine it. You don't just read it. You don't just get facts. This is what happens with so many people. They just take information from the Bible and they can spit it back to you. Did you know a computer can do that? But a computer's never going to have its heart changed. It's never going to raise anybody from the dead. You got to get it beyond just your mental understanding. You have to get it down on the inside of you. And this is how you do it. Also, I went and looked up something. I've been referring to using your tongue to write upon your heart. And I was trying to do it by memory and I missed it. It was Proverbs chapter 3. For those of you that are wanting to know this, let me just read this to you real quickly. It's Proverbs, I was saying Psalms, chapter 30, I think it was, and at least I had the three, right? But in Proverbs, chapter 3, it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So this says that you have to write mercy and truth upon the table of your heart. And then it's Psalms, chapter 45, and verse 1. That says, uh, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So your tongue, your words are how you write things on your heart. And I mentioned some of this this morning that you have to start speaking what God says about you instead of speaking other things. The doctor will say that you're going to die. You know, uh, Dave was talking about things that he went through. Greg talked about uh, some of the things he went through. And those things, people speaking things to you, they're words that write on your heart. You can change that. 
by speaking what your heavenly Father says about you and speaking these things out. And you have to meditate on that. And part of meditating is speaking. I'm not going to spend the whole night talking about meditation, but I just wanted to tie these things together because I'm trying to make this as practical as I can. It's one thing to say you need to keep your mind stayed on the Lord, but how do you do it? So I'm trying to bring in some of these things that part of using your imagination is to take Scripture and meditate on it day and night and see yourself doing it. Use your imagination. When you see Jesus doing things, see yourself doing it. See yourself being one of those. You know, I'm what they call a lucid dreamer. I've uh, read articles in Reader's Digest and other things about this. And I can go to sleep and in two or three minutes I'll dream five or six things. I dream all the time. When I'm asleep, I'm awake. I, I, it's hard for me. If I wake up in the middle of the night and want to go back to sleep, and if I have trouble falling asleep, it's hard for me to tell if I've fallen asleep. Because I think constantly. Even when I'm asleep, I'm thinking. And the only time I can tell sometime that I went to sleep is because my dreams, you know, get like a little weird where you're running in sand and not going anywhere or something like that. It's hard for me to tell if I'm awake or asleep. And I dream in color. And I, my dreams are vivid, and I mean, I see things. And anyway, my point is that I don't know if everybody's, I guess everybody's not like that, but I dream uh, not only when I'm awake, but when I'm asleep. I'm just constantly, my mind and my heart is working. I don't know if that's a result of me meditating on things during the day or if it was, I don't know what it is. But anyway, it's good. I learn a lot of stuff. God speaks, and I doubt if there's use, there's probably not a week that goes by that God doesn't show me something significant in a dream. And I mean, this isn't just old man dreaming dreams. This has been happening since I was a kid. <laughs> when I was a kid, the same thing happened. And so, uh, but God speaks to me and I just see things. I'm very, uh, I don't know, my imagination is active. When we drew plans for this building, did you know that the builders sit down and he would start trying to explain something to me and he wouldn't even get halfway through. And I said, oh, that's exactly what I'm saying. Or I'd say, no, that's not what I'd want. And after working with me for a while, our architect, he, he says, you're one of the very few people that can see things without having to see it. Usually I have to draw it out and make it clear. But, you know, I can see things with my heart. And I think a large part of it is because I meditate on the Word. So, again, if you are just getting started, there's a time for you to just study the Word and get this information in you because you can't meditate on information that you don't know. And sadly, most people have never even read the Bible. Did you know one of the requirements in my first year classes at the Bible college is that you have to read the Bible through in one year? We give you a Bible reading program. And some people always whine about it. Some people complain. But I just think it's terrible to come to a Bible college and graduate and never have read the Bible. <laughs> to me, that just doesn't even make sense. So it's one of the requirements. You've got to read through the Bible in your first year of Bible school. That averages four chapters a day. And 20% of your grade, if you made 100 on everything else, and if you didn't read through the Bible, the best you could do would be an 80 and so it's just part of the deal. And so you've got to read through the Bible. But in my own personal life, I have been studying the Word now for 47 years. And I've been reading anywhere from 10 to 15 hours a day for months and years I did that. And still, there's been times in the last week or two that I've sat down and spent 10 hours a day studying the Word. I still... Spend as much time as I possibly can studying the Word. But now the majority of my revelation from God isn't reading the Word and putting information in me, but it's taking things that I've already seen and may have some revelation on, and I'll just meditate on it. I sit in swings out on our porch, and I'll just sit and think about stuff. The Lord will show me something, and typically what happens if He quickens something to me, man, I'll get up and go to walking. On my trail, and I'll go to pray in tongues, and I'll pray over it, and I may spend a day or two just focused on that one scripture, just meditating on it, going over and over it. You know, Joshua chapter 1, 
verse uh, eight. I use that verse already, but it says this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But you shall. uh, How does it go? But you shall meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. And so when it talks about meditating, it says it shall not depart out of your mouth. Part of how you meditate is to just speak it over and over. Matter of fact, if you were to take this word meditate and just break it down. Again, this is part of the way that you keep your mind stayed on the Lord. It's not just deal with things on a surface level, but you just keep digging. You dig everything you can out of a scripture. You look at it from every way you can think of. You go in and you examine these words and stuff. And if you follow the word on meditate, it literally is talking about to... Mutter to yourself over and over. It's talking about speaking. You just say something over and over and over. Uh, the comparison's been used. I think it was Kenneth Hagin that used to compare it to a cow chewing its cud. To where you eat it, you swallow it, and you spit it back up and go through it again. And you just do this over and over and over. And you meditate on something. And I tell you, here's my experience. I've been at this for 47 years, seeking God with everything I've got. I have read scriptures thousands of times, and I have yet to find a scripture that I've gotten everything that there is in it out of it. I can take any scripture. I don't care how much I've meditated on it. And if I just take that verse and sit down and say, Father, show me. Something new out of this. I can take any verse and God will give me a new twist on that, a new application, a new way of understanding it, a new way of explaining it. The word of God is endless. You never get it figured out. If you're the kind that says, oh, I've heard this before. I want to hear something new. You know what? You aren't a good meditator. If you are really meditating in the Word of God day and night, you can take anything and see some new application, some new light to come out of it. It's always fresh. The Word of God just has layer after layer after layer after layer of revelation in it. And you cannot mind the depths of it. You can never get to the bottom of the Word of God. It's unsearchable. Some of you are thinking, man, that's weird. But I'm, I think you're weird. <laughs> God has given us this treasure. It's awesome. It's awesome. And some people think, oh, I've heard that before. That doesn't mean a thing. You know, it's not how much you know. It's how much you know what you know. There's a difference. Over here in Psalms chapter 5, verse 1. It says, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. Notice, in these verses right here, he says, give ear to my words, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. He's talking about crying out to God. And God hearing his words and prayer, and right in the midst of that, he lists meditation. The reason I bring this out is to say that meditation is prayer. When you're meditating, when you're sitting there and God is showing something to you, and you're saying, Father, what does this mean? How does this apply to me? What are you trying to tell me through this? How can this change my life? How can I use these things to help other people? When you're meditating in the Word, you are praying. You are in communion with God. And if you are going to dwell in the secret place of the Most High, if you're going to live there, you are going to have to learn how to meditate. And here's a different way of saying it. Did you know that the same part of you that meditates is the same part of you that worries? Meditation is nothing but positive worry. Some of you think, well, I've got a job. I'm not a preacher. I can't sit around all day long and pray and just meditate on the things of God. You can go to work and and worry all day long. 
You can go to work and even though you do your job, you are still thinking, God, how am I ever going to get out of this situation? Where's my finances going to come from? How's my marriage going to be fixed? Or you could worry about your health or you could worry about anything. Did you know you can worry and, and still function? And all worry is, is meditation on something negative, anticipating the negative. Worry is your imagination thinking about the worst case scenario and imagining what would happen if I fail. What would happen if this goes to a bad conclusion? That's all that worry is. Meditation is the same thing. It's the same part of you. If you can worry all day long, you can meditate all day long. And all you got to do is just take the Word of God and get some revelation from God and just begin to focus on it. And meditate on it and go over it and over it and over it. Man, there's so much I'd like to say here. Let me, let's turn over to Psalms chapter 23, 23rd Psalms. Everybody knows this Psalms. Let me just give you an illustration of how you meditate on the Word. And again, you don't have to do it exactly the way I do, but this, I think the principles I'll be sharing here will apply to you. And you can, you can change it and apply it to your individual situation. But look at this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did you know you can read that, and even though it may minister something to you, it's like there's gold in this. And you've got to mine it. You've got to draw it out. It's more than just being able to recite it. You've got to meditate on it until these things become real to you. So here's the way that I meditate on Scripture. This is just an example. But you can take every single word. Meditate on every single word. Look at this. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Think about that. Why did they use the word the? Why didn't they say a Lord is my shepherd? This is identifying a single God. There's only one God. And you can take that and you could spend 30 minutes or an hour thinking about, Father, thank you that you aren't like anybody else. And you aren't like, you know, here's the Muslims who say that they pray five times a day. What good is it doing them? Man, they're full of hate. They're out killing people in the name of the Lord. And see, you can sit there and think, Thank you that you are my shepherd and not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Hare Krishna, not somebody else. And you could be just thinking about that and you could compare this and you could spend 30 minutes, an hour. You could spend days just thinking about, thank you that you are our Lord. You know, God is God. Is God. He could be whoever he wants to be. He could be mean. He could be angry. He could be all kinds of stuff. And yet our God is love. So the Lord specifying a specific God. You just think about that and see, you could you could take a verse like that. You could read this in the morning and then all day long at work. You could just be thinking about God. You aren't like any other God. And when you hear somebody else talking about something, talking about New Age, talking about whoever it is that they worship or whatever, just be contrasting your God with their God all day long and thinking about it. And you know what? That keeps your mind stayed on the Lord. And you get revelation out of this. You'll see things. And then it says the Lord. Lord here is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. You ought to go look at that in the Hebrew and find out what this is talking about and just study the name of the Lord. This is talking about Jehovah. The first time that God ever revealed himself by the name Jehovah was to uh, Moses. And he says, I've never revealed myself by this name. And you go studying what that means. And you can spend days studying and thinking about Jehovah, what it means. 
It's awesome. Again, I could spend hours telling you the things that I've studied about this, but you could, here's two words that you could spend at least a week or two meditating on two words, thinking about it. I know some of you think, man, I've never done that, obviously. (laughs) That's the reason we have such a short attention span. Man, you just skim over things. You are a multitasker, you know. I always get in trouble every time I say this. But all multitasking is, it means you do multiple things poorly. (laughs) Paul said, this one thing I do, if you are going to really succeed in the things of the Lord, you've got to get to where you are laser focused on God. Your attention is on Him. And I mean, you are taking every word in the Bible and dissecting that thing and thinking about how does this apply to me? God, what are you saying through this? And you just meditate on it. And if you aren't willing to invest some time, you aren't going to get your mind stayed upon the Lord. Our minds wander. And you have to, as I was talking about that word stayed in uh, Isaiah chapter 23, uh, 26 verse 3 means to lay hold. You have to lay hold and you have to control your mind and discipline it and not let it wander. Did you know that one of the words that we use often when you're talking about uh, that you're just completely captivated by something, you say you're mesmerized. You know where that word came from? There was a psychiatrist, or a psychologist, I guess, forgot the exact word. But anyway, this guy was a doctor of something, and he's one that came up with hypnosis. He's the one that developed it. And he would literally draw people under his spell to where you were mesmerized. It's what we talk about, hypnotized. And when you're mesmerized, it means that your total attention is just focused on that. You're oblivious to anything else. You're in a... a, hypnotized state. And did you know that this is what we do a lot of times? We get tired, you come home and you want to rest and you don't even feel like getting in and doing anything. So you just plop down in front of a television and get mesmerized and let that thing control your thoughts and you don't control yourself. Every time you do that, you are making yourself a little bit less disciplined to where you are less in control and you're just being controlled and having stuff fed to you. Even if it was good stuff, which it usually isn't, but even if it was good stuff, there's advantage to not just sitting here and letting somebody else control your thoughts. You need to get to where you control your thoughts and meditating on the things of God, getting in the word of God. Focusing your attention, laying hold of truth and keeping your mind stayed upon God is important. It usually goes over about like that. (laughs) Nobody wants to hear this. We're like water. We take the path of least resistance. Did you know serving God and loving God and getting your heart established And focused on the things of God and dwelling in the secret place of the Most High is not the easiest thing to do. It's easier to be sick than it is to get healed. It's not more fun. It's hard on you in a lot of ways. But as far as effort, anybody can get sick. Anybody can be poor. Anybody can be depressed. But to grab hold of your mind and focus it, I guarantee you it's going to take discipline and a lot of people are just too lazy to do it. You're going to have to focus and you're going to have to get in and start studying some things. Find out why the word Lord is capitalized. All of it's capitalized. Find out why that happened. I could preach a whole message on that, but I'm just showing you these things. Then it says the Lord is my shepherd. He's not going to be my shepherd. He not wa- he wasn't just my shepherd in the past. That means present tense. Right now, wherever I am, whatever I'm going through, the Lord is my shepherd. And you could sit there and think on that. That God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's not just going to be in the future. And he's not, he's the, not the great I was. He's not the great I'm going to be. He's the great I am out of Exodus chapter 4. And see, so you can mo- focus on that. You could spend all day long. You could take this verse and then go to work 
And thank you, Father, that you are my shepherd. You are right now, today, whatever I'm going through, you are my shepherd. And you, if you were to go through a day just thinking about that, that God, you are my shepherd right now. Today, you're my shepherd. You're going to supply every need. And if you went through your day with your mind focused and stayed on that, then it wouldn't matter what the uh, occurrence was. It wouldn't matter what happens to you. You'd still be praising God at the end of the day. You know, one of the songs that Daniel sings that I just really love is that one about bless the Lord, O my soul. And that first verse says, whatever. uh, How's it go? Whatever may past and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. All of us desire that, but you know how you do it? You keep your mind stayed on God. And this is just one example, but if you go through the day, Father, you are my shepherd. I don't care what I go through today. I'm going to be able to deal with it. And you have that mindset, I could guarantee you by the end of the day, you'd still be singing at the end of the day because he's your shepherd and you were focused on it. Isn't this simple? This is so simple. You got to have somebody to help you to misunderstand what I'm saying. And yet it's amazing how people don't do this. I'm, I'm just demonstrating how you meditate. And so the Lord is my shepherd. He's not just Paul Milligan's shepherd. He's not just Barry Bennett's shepherd. He's not just Wendell's or Daniel's or somebody else. He's my shepherd. If it'll work for Andrew, it'll work for me. The Lord is my shepherd. There, it isn't just the clergy and the lady. This isn't just going to work for people that are in full-time ministry. The Lord is my shepherd. And boy, you go to focusing on the fact that he's mine. Father, thank you that you are my shepherd. I don't have to have somebody with their collar turned around backwards to pray for me and intercede and figure things out. I got a personal relationship. You are my shepherd. You go to thinking about that and just go to thanking God all day that, Father, you're my shepherd, my personal shepherd. If, if I was the only person alive on this planet, God would have died for me. He's my shepherd. He will take care of me. God's got an entire universe to run. He's got millions, billions of, of his children, and yet he is my personal shepherd. He is available to me today. He is going to deal with anything that happens. You know, there's some days that I'm up against some things that I, you know, there's certain things that I just really hate doing. I'm not an administrative type deal. And sometimes I have to do administrative things and it bothers me. (laughs) I'd rather be preaching to you. I could do this 24-7. Amen. You can wake me up out of a dead sleep. I can preach. But you know what? You, there's sometimes I have to go in and do things, and it's a problem. And it bothers me. And I minister this to myself all of the time. That, Father, there's nothing I'm going to encounter today that you and I can't handle. And if I'll just stay in tune with you, you will give me wisdom. And what I'm doing is this exact same thing. Father, you're my shepherd. You will show me today what I need to do to deal with the stuff that I have to deal with. And I meditate on this. It changes my life. The Lord is my shepherd. Man, you could, you could go think about this for a long period of time. You could go study shepherding and sheep. There's a reason that God compared his children to sheep. I'm not going to go into that. I've had... I've had some people say that sheep are dumb, and then I've had people who own sheep that say that they really aren't dumb, that they're really smart. But I can tell you one thing about sheep is they have a herd mentality. If one sheep jumps off a cliff, the others will tend to go right off the cliff after them. And, you know, they just tend to wander, and they're, they're, if they get isolated... If they're away from the shepherd, there are just so many things you could think about. And you could think about how a shepherd, you could take the examples that Jesus did in the New Testament. And he illustrated that if a person had a hundred sheep and if they lost one, he would leave the ninety nine and go looking for that one. And when he finds the one, he would put that sheep on his shoulders and he would come home rejoicing and ask his neighbors to rejoice with him because he had found the one that was lost. 
And from that, you could meditate about how much God loves us, how much he loves you, how much he's compassionate for you and how much he longs to help you. And he's looking for you. And if you've strayed from him, man, he doesn't go find the sheet and then beat it. He finds it and puts it on his shoulders and carries it and comes back home and throws a party because he found his lost sheep. Take that and minister that to yourself. Instead of ministering guilt and condemnation, the Lord is my shepherd. And think about how a shepherd lays his life down for a sheep. John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. I laid down my life. He says, I am the door of the sheepfold. That describes that they had these stone walls that they would build and they would put their sheep in at night. And the uh, wolves, the uh, lions couldn't get over the walls. The only way they could get in to that sheepfold was through the door and the shepherd would lay across the door and lay his life down to protect his sheep. Man, think about that, how that the Lord says that you are in the palm of my hand and nobody is able to pluck you out of my hand. And think about that. Think about the Lord being your shepherd and the things that he said. You think about that all day long and I, ain't, I dare you to be depressed. You can't be depressed thinking about the Lord is my shepherd. I've used one phrase. And if you were to meditate on this, I guarantee you it's impossible for you to be depressed meditating day and night in the Word of God. If you're depressed, if you're discouraged, it's because you are looking at the things that are happening in the natural and you are using your imagination to see the bad stuff. Project where this is going to lead. You are seeing yourself dying. You're seeing yourself failing. You're seeing your marriage never change. You're seeing yourself a victim and you can't ever do anything about it. You're seeing yourself as, God, I'm only human and I can't do anything. You aren't seeing yourself in Christ. If you are depressed, it's because you're thinking in a depressed state and your emotions just follow your thinking. Amen or oh me. Many of you think, well, now you're ignoring the fact that this is a chemical condition and that there's all of these. It's not true. It's not true. It is not physical that makes you the way you are. It's the way you think. Again, I can go back to Isaiah 26, 3. The Lord will keep him in perfect peace. That's an emotion. It's not only an emotion, but it is an emotion. It involves your emotion. And the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. Your emotions are linked to what you think. If you're depressed, it's not your chemicals. It's not your time of the month. It is your thinking that makes you depressed. And you're using these other things as an excuse. Thank you for that one. That's right, Lawson. I think we'll let you preach in the morning. That was so good. <laughs> Lawson's going to minister in the morning. You're going to love him. He's awesome. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you keep your mind stayed on the Lord, you'll be in perfect peace. If you think on these things, it's impossible to be depressed. I had a guy who was manic depressive come to me one time and he says, but I've got a a doctor's report to prove that I've got this mental condition. And I said, all the doctor is doing is just looking on the outside, on the physical. He's telling you about the results. And you can take pills that will, you know, numb you and make you doped up to where you aren't as sensitive to your feelings and emotions. I'm saying that drugs can affect your feelings. But the root of that problem isn't just physical. It's your thinking. And I told him, I said, no, you are the way you are because of the way you think. And he says, no, here. And he pulled out his doctor's report. And I said, I can tell you what you think. And he said, okay. And I said, here's how you think. And I told him when he went to bed at night, I said, here's how you think. You just think about everything that went wrong all day long. And you think about it and you rehearse it and go over it in your mind and think about what you could have done better and stuff, and you go to sleep, and when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is think about how bad yesterday is, was, and then you start thinking about, man, I wonder what's going to happen today. And you start anticipating everything that could go wrong. If you know that you got some tough stuff coming, you just start, th- and he says, that's exactly what I do. He says, how did you know? And I said, because as you think in your heart, that's the way you are. If you're depressed, you've got to be thinking on your circumstances in a depressing way. 
That's true. I'm preaching better than you're listening. If you would meditate in the Word of God day and night, if you would keep your mind stayed on the Lord, you would have perfect peace, period, period, period. There is no exceptions to this. That's the answer. You know, we've got a video. I wish we had it available right now. I don't know if we do or not. But Nicole, this woman that graduated from our Chicago school, was, um, anyways, long story, she had many problems, sexually abused, all kinds of things happened. And she had, she was married and I think had two kids. And yet she was just, she fell into such depression that uh, it, she was suicidal. And she didn't kill herself, but she wound up cutting herself. And she just cut herself, and she was in the hospital often. And um, anyway, she got hold of my teaching. She was a Christian, and she went to Bible studies, and she had people pray for her. And she, she did everything she knew, and she could not defeat it. And she got hold of this teaching, talking about, as you think in your heart, that's the way you are. She got started thinking on who she was in Christ found out who she was, and she's now completely delivered, I think, for nine years. She's now graduated from our Bible college, and she's teaching Bible study and started a ministry helping women who've been depressed and suicidal and things like that. Amen. Do you have it? You got it here? Is it cute? Oh, cute. <laughs> I thought you said it was cute. <laughs> it's really cute. Well, I need to quit. Good news Let's go ahead and watch it. That's fine. Play, play the thing. ...has arisen from her own tragic story. For years, she engaged in cutting herself because of the deep emotional scars still bound to her from a childhood full of abuse and trauma. Repeatedly confined to mental hospitals, suffering an incurable diagnosis of severe bipolar disorder with PTSD. This is her healing journey. After we had our three children, I started having flashbacks of sexual abuse. Having um, step parents that I didn't feel um, really liked me as a kid was very difficult. I was just looking for attention. I was looking to feel loved and I felt like I needed to punish myself and that's why I started self-injuring. It was almost like harming myself was a release from that and it was easier for me to feel the physical pain than the emotional pain I was feeling. Coming from not really understanding what was going on uh, not really knowing what to do, trying to protect the best I could, her and the kids and myself. My oldest daughter, when she was the age I was, um, being sexually abused, that just came back as flashbacks. And the only way to cope was to drink alcohol. And so I became so dependent on it that I started hiding it in the house and not letting my husband know even though I was a believer, going to church, going to Bible studies, doing all of this, I felt like there was no way out. I, I think I was a bit like a robot, just going through the motion of the day, uh, seeing what I could do for the kids, just going to work. For me personally, I mean, the, the pain was, you know, unbearable. I was going through alcohol withdrawal and shaking. I had tremors. I relapsed after relapse, after relapse, after relapse on alcohol. And I felt so much shame and guilt of just being um, a mentally ill mother with addictions because I wanted my kids to have a better life than I had. And I always wanted to try to find a way to fix it and try to solve the problems for her and try to mitigate things and I could never do that. Strongholds came in of, you know, there's something wrong with you. Nobody wants you. Nobody loves you. I took a butcher knife in the kitchen and just started cutting my legs and started cutting my body. And I um, ended up being admitted to the psych ward for the first time at that moment. I thought maybe the combination of medication and outside support through Christian counseling would be what was needed. But after years of kind of trying this, it never really worked, at least not, you know, sustainably. And I would even carry razor blades and 
pills in my purse just in case I wanted to commit suicide somewhere. I would drive to different restaurants far away so that I wouldn't run into anybody and I would write goodbye letters. And what, what would happen if? And I need to be a single parent. What kind of care would I need and how would I raise them and, you know, what, who is going to supplement what they need from a mom. I mean, this was in my mind at one point. I was self-injuring um, my, my wrist and I was watching the blood flow. I knew that I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, you don't have to do that anymore because my son shed his blood for you. And I just remember I started weeping. I thought I had to get all the sin out of my life before God would want relationship with me or that he would love me. And here he was pursuing me with his love. And he was trying to tell me, my son took the punishment. For all sin, he took your punishment at the cross. You are loved, you are forgiven, you are righteous. But I just didn't know how to be well. I went to the psychiatrist and took all kinds of tests. And basically, they said that you are a classic bipolar case. Now, this is something that I had to live with for the rest of my life, I thought, because I was told it was incurable, and all they could do was manage it with medication. Well, you have either high intensity of activity or hyper joy or, you know, being super active in the house, so painting, uh, repainting, and, and, and changing furniture. And then you would have moments which were the opposite, in complete low of not really interested in anything, uh, kind of... Closing back. According to the World Health Organization, bipolar disorder has become the sixth leading cause of disability in the world. As many as one in five patients with this diagnosis commit suicide. Approximately two million cases of cutting behavior are reported each year in the U.S. Many more go unreported. After years of torment and relapses and psych wards, I was invited to go to a Christian recovery meeting. And I had told her no a couple of times, but I met a couple of women at this uh, meeting, and they were leaders there. And one of the leaders I was corresponding with at the time, and I told her all of my diagnoses. Um, we were writing emails at the time and she wrote to me, with God all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with him. Am I going to believe the word of God that says I'm healed or am I going to believe what the doctors say that they say this is incurable and I need to be on medication for the rest of my life? And I got a revelation at that point that as a child of God, I don't have to take this anymore. I am healed, and I can use my authority. In Luke 10, 19, Jesus said he has given us all authority over all the power of the enemy. I no longer cut myself. I no longer drank and got drunk. I no longer, um, you know, had that suicidal thinking. When she stopped taking the medication was... You know, a bit of a concern, but I, I was hanging for the hope and the understanding that she, you know, heard from God and was on the right path. People at my church, they, they saw me and they came up to me, people that didn't know me, and they were like, what happened to you? Because they used to see me in shame, walking with my head down, like in bondage. I just had a peace. I had a supernatural peace. I had regularly gone to see my psychiatrist, and he told me he doesn't know of anybody who's ever been healed of bipolar disorder. My identity went from all of these labels to child of God, and I have never spoken those labels over my life ever since that day. I knew that I knew that I knew that I was healed, and no one could take that away from me. Healing is the children's bread, is what Jesus said. It belongs to you. It's already accomplished. It's not based on your holiness, on your goodness, whether you fasted and prayed and done all of the right things. It's already on the inside of you. The only thing you got to do to release it is renew this mind. I knew there was more. I knew that I needed a deeper foundation in Christ. 
I knew that I needed a deeper foundation in the Word of God and was introduced to Andrew Womack and uh, started listening to him and uh, loved his books, uh, The War is Over, You've Already Got It. And then somebody invited me to a Karis Bible College meeting because a satellite school was opening up uh, in my area. I am learning how to speak blessings over my life instead of curses and death. We are overcomers in Christ. We are no longer victims. Karis is not only helping me uh, personally and my family become a better mother, better wife, it's helping the brokenhearted out there see that Jesus set the captives free, and I am one of them. Thank you, Jesus. The truth of God's word that I'm getting from Karis has gone into my books, my materials, and also wherever I speak. I love to go into the places where there are really broken, wounded people and tell them how much God loves you and how much God accepts you, how forgiven you are. Carrie's Bible College has, um, has grounded Nicole in, in so many different ways. She's really um, at peace and really enjoying meeting people where they are. She always comes really encouraged from you know the, the classes. I just couldn't get enough of the word. Going to Karis has changed my life. It has just um, increased my healing by showing me who I am in Christ and um, understanding that we already have everything in us through Jesus Christ. I think she has such a thirst for learning more and sharing that. Um, she's full of joy and she's just a, incredibly filled with love and happiness. Andrew is on first thing in the morning and I just get my coffee and I'm in front of the TV. I love that he is just so bold with the truth that I need to hear that and he is such an inspiration of how we are called to live. We have restored a lot of the happiness, uh, a lot of the um, you know, fun things that we can do together. I am a stay-at-home mom, I'm a, a minister. We, I think, all have now the, the right direction in, in fulfilling what we've been called to do. We are overcomers in Christ. We are no longer victims. Negative things come against us, and we have a choice of what we can do. We can dwell on those thoughts and have negative feelings, or we can focus on the truth of God's Word and be filled with joy and walk in our identities in Christ and who we really are in the Spirit. And, and I think what's amazing is how things are being multiplied. This is what I always think of in how much our story now is touching more and more people in helping them through their journey and they will do the same thing and it will continue on. And my husband bought me a license plate that says hope as a Christmas gift one year because that's our story that we want to get out to people. There's more than hope in Jesus Christ. There is victory in Jesus Christ. And you know what God did for Nicole? He'll do for any person. And I don't know if you picked up, but she says you can either think on these negative things and have negative emotions, or you can think on the things of God. And so this is what we've been, I believe it's what God's been saying all week long, is about keeping your mind stayed on God, dwelling in the secret place, using your imagination to meditate, to see the Word of God come alive to you. It's powerful. The Word of God is the most powerful force on the planet. Amen. When Jesus comes back, he's going to, there's going to be a sharp two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. And with it, he will slay his enemies and the blood will flow up to the horse's bridles. That means three and four feet tall for something like 120 miles. Can you imagine how powerful that is? It's greater than any atomic bomb. And I believe that that symbolism, the word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. And all it's saying is that when he comes back and all of these armies of the earth oppose him, all he's going to do is speak the word that is already written for us. And that word spoken with 100% faith will destroy any enemy. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he didn't come up with something new to say. Although if he would have said boo, that would have been scripture. 
But instead, he said, it is written. And one time I thought, God, why did you quote scripture when you were the word? You could have said anything. And he told me, he says, because I couldn't improve on it. It was perfect. He went back and quoted scripture. If Jesus quoted scripture, you need to quote scripture. You need to get the power of God's word in your mouth and you go to meditate in it. We've taken one phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, and I spent 45 minutes talking about it. And I could have spent an hour or so on each one of those words easily. You can spend an entire day meditating on that one phrase. And I didn't even get into the, I, we only finished half of the first verse. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there is no reason why we shouldn't keep our minds stayed upon God. We can do it. And we need to do it. And if you'll do that, you'll be in perfect peace. You'll dwell in the shadow of the Almost High. Whatever you do will prosper. You will see the Word of God literally transform your life. Amen? Amen. Praise God. That's just awesome. Thank you, Jesus. I'd like to ask our prayer ministers to come down here again.